Très bien. Donc, euh, voilà, c'est un grand plaisir euh, que d'introduire euh, Roland Guénabé euh, pour euh, donc, cet exposé. Euh, je ne vais pas faire une, une, un historique complet, mais euh, <rire> c'est quasiment impossible. Mais donc, euh, Roland a été très actif en France, notamment au LRI, euh, euh, à l'Université euh, Descartes, euh, à l'INRIA. Euh, où il a travaillé avec, euh, avec Jacques Williams en particulier. Ensuite, il y a eu une longue période aux États-Unis, où il a été à l'université Duke d'abord, et puis ensuite à l'université de Central Florida. Euh, ensuite, une période non moins longue en Bretagne, à Imperial College. Il y avait avant ceci une période aussi euh, que j'ai oubliée, mais qui est très importante pour Erol à l'université de Liège. Euh, et dans une période plus récente, après euh, la, les années qu'il a passé à Imperial College, euh, Irol est actuellement actif dans tout un ensemble d'institutions, euh, notamment euh, à l'Université de Nice, euh, Sophie Antipolis, et euh, à l'Académie des sciences de Pologne. Je donne juste un petit aperçu. Et donc, je suis très heureux qu'il ait accepté de venir donner cet exposé aujourd'hui. Irol. Merci. Euh, oui, je vais faire quelques mots en français, puis je passerai à, à l'anglais. Donc, quand je venais ici dans les années euh, 80, 79, 80, 80 euh, je, je descendais, euh, en fait, je descendais au guichet, puis j'avais une tente. Euh, je venais à enseigner à Lille. Pendant 9 ans, j'ai enseigné à Polytechnique. Donc, je faisais la tente pour arriver euh, chez. Apparemment, la tente existe toujours, mais aujourd'hui, j'ai été plus prudent, j'ai pris un taxi. <rire> pour passer moins de temps sur le chemin de la rue. So I'm just mentioning that uh, for those of you who don't, don't, uh, are, are, don't feel comfortable in, in, uh, uh, in Italian, sorry, French, uh, I, I just, just mentioning that many years ago in the early 80s, I used to come here to this area, well, mostly fields. I mean, there weren't any, just one set of buildings around the Ecole Polytechnique. And there was enough space for the polytechnicians to have their horses here. Uh, so one of the advantages of studying at Ecole Polytechnique was to be able to have a horse on campus that they would look after. And so um, we'd come up, you know, to, to arrive here, I'd take the train to Guichet and then come up the slope. And um, very early in the morning, because my classes, it was at eight. So I had to get started at six, uh, go up there between seven and eight, and then I was up there. And those were the good old days. Uh, and I'm back here and I see all these buildings. You know, it looks like we are in some kind of, um, what should I say? What does it look like? It looks a little bit like um, something out of science fiction. How about that? Uh, and what I'd like to tell you about uh, today is some aspects of IoT networks. In recent years, since uh, the mid Uh, to 2010s, I mean, around 2014-15, I started to have large uh, EU grants, uh, which are called research and innovation actions. They're about 5 million euros, typically, a little bit more, they can be bigger, they can be just a little bit less, um, but they cover areas which are supposed to be to involve engineering, you know, research, but also engineering. So you have demonstrators, you have industry participating and so on. Um, so they're not, you know, they don't allow you to work purely on your research, but you have to interact with industry and so on. And I do enjoy them. And just when uh, Brexit happened, was voted, because it took a while to actually happen, but just when it was voted in 2016, I won one more. I have been a uh, coordinator of a program called Nemesis, which was a research and innovation action. And I won another one called uh, CER IoT, which was running for another four or five years. So at that point, I was told politely that I couldn't have that and run it in the UK. Uh, so that's when I got a position in Poland. <laughs> and since then, I've had several EU programs running in Poland with colleagues and of course with other participants, you know, for instance, Technical University of Budapest or um, people in Italy and so on. So we have in Greece, uh, so we have again uh, something running right now called IOTAC. So now this is the fourth since then, the fourth program of this kind since then. And I think I've just won another one. So uh, 
uh, that's that's the news. That's the kind of informal news. You only know it when you get the letter. I think we have another one starting. So uh, this work is part of this sequence of things. Ser IoT was one of the projects. Uh, uh, this one is called IOCAC. That's that's the uh, that's the logo. And what's the story about? The story is about the fact that um, IoT networks uh, are you might, you might say part of the internet, uh, but they are different. Uh, they're different in the sense that you know if you if you set up uh, a mobile phone call with someone, uh, whether you get the call or not is uncertain, right? Uh, so our mobile telephones are not very certain, not very reliable objects. Uh, sometimes they make you pay crazy things. Very often they ask you to call twice. I mean, they organize themselves to make you call two times to get one call and so on, all kinds of strange things. But the other thing is that you're not guaranteed to set up your call. While, for instance, when you're dealing with IP networks, uh, we are used to connecting very reliably. Well, IoT networks are not as reliable as IP networks in general, you know, as the internet in general. So they pose specific problems, some of them related to performance. And I think you uh, understand that uh, in a few minutes, why performance problems exist. Others uh, related to um, attacks. So they're very prone to all kinds of attacks. Uh, and the attacks, uh, some of them are uh, essentially, at the end of the day, denial of service attacks, but they can be very nasty. Uh, some of them uh, actually try to compromise the network and make it do things that it shouldn't be doing, and that, that are harmful to the system that is being controlled. After all, IoT networks are there to do what? They're there to do two things. They're there to collect data, measurement, and they're there to control physical objects. Okay? So these two aspects, collecting data, if the data is unreliable, your control may be great, but it's useless or it's harmful. Okay? Or uh, you may have all the data in a very precise manner, but your control is harmed uh, because the system is being attacked or it arrives too late. I mean, there's no point in controlling a real-time system if you're late. Uh, saying move your arm this way of the arm has gone all way beyond that point uh, when, you, when you get that command so the performance and uh, security issues uh, can have uh, kind of interesting and unpleasant effects on the system okay and the uh, types of compromises you have are botnets uh, denial of service attacks and, and malware that can be installed okay and that's why um, uh, a lot of organizations around the world have these uh, research projects on the Internet of Things uh, because, you know, there are all these problems. Okay? And what we're trying to get is better security and performance. Now, to understand why, um, uh, to understand why there may be all these problems, it's good to know what these networks are made of. Uh, uh, these networks, of course, con contain IP nodes, okay, which may be using TCP IP or maybe using UDP or maybe using something else. So that's fine. But uh, there are two uh, differences with the kind of networks we deal with. Okay, uh, for instance, this is an IP network terminal. Okay, and with respect to an IoT node, it's huge. It is huge in the sense that there's a lot of computing power here that is not available in the IoT node. So uh, you have low cost nodes, low computational power. And one thing that's quite interesting is factory initialization. So for instance, a lot of the passwords associated with IoT nodes are put in, inside node at the factory level. Now, if someone has that privileged information, they can use it to tamper with the network. Okay. So the fact that these are simple and kind of factory produced things mean that uh, you can't go in and kind of individually put in passwords and so on. You have to deal with whatever the factory gives you. And this has consequences. Uh, the other aspect is that some of the nodes may be battery operated. In fact, they very often are. Okay. 
And they're not rechargeable in the usual sense. They're not like our laptops that we recharge. Uh, they have to recharge themselves somehow. Why? Because you can't send people to put in batteries. And if you're going to wire them, why have batteries? Okay. So these are very simple devices with batteries which have a certain lifetime and which have some means, which may have some means of recharging themselves, for instance, through photovoltaic. So that, those are the things. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, I'm telling you all the things that make it complicated and bad. Another aspect is the channels, um, uh, like ultra wideband, are shareable channels. They're simple shareable channels. And that in itself, creates problems uh, of a kind we will see shortly, okay? performance problems. Uh, they are difficult to coordinate and contrary to IP networks, they do not self-regulate. Okay? IP networks work well because they self-regulate through some things like UDP where you say, I don't care what happens. I mean, I've lost the packet, uh, but too bad. Or you use TCP IP and then you say, well, I will back off. So you have a self-regulating framework. There you go. I keep on adding complications. Uh, some of the nodes have to transmit periodically. Okay, why? Well, they're measuring. Uh, unless you measure the temperature periodically, it's of no interest. So you're going to measure the temperature periodically, and then you're going to uh, send it somewhere. Okay, so this creates periodic uh, traffic. Okay? And the nodes are not synchronized perfectly, okay? but they're all doing similar things. And they may have also different periodicity because one is measuring water flow, the other one is measuring temperature or whatever in the room. Okay. Now, uh, you use, you tend to use, in addition to the IoT nodes, you tend to use special gateways, okay, which are there to collect data uh, from through generally wireless channels, uh, collect data into the uh, um, into the system that's then going to use this data. So these are all kind of the kind of the variations you have on these um, IoT networks. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you just about. I can't, of course, cover. I, I don't plan to cover everything we're doing or everything we've published in this area. I, I'd just like to talk to you about a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, the performance issues. Okay, the performance issues, and we found a very simple algorithm to improve, make the performance issues better. Okay. And um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is uh, attack detection. Okay, because uh, you need to at least have a gateway at all of the gateways, you need to have attack detectors running all the time. Uh, because these systems are so accessible, for instance, if you have UWB, ultra wideband, you can have dummy nodes that come in and uh, attack the network. Okay. Uh, the IoT devices themselves uh, seldom have attack detectors. Why? Because they can't afford the, computer, the computing power to handle that. So they're prone to attacks and they may, may have uh, malware. So they may be taken over by the attacker uh, to create a botnet. Uh, or may, they may have been turned into something that generates bad traffic or whatever. So often it is at the gateway level, uh, level that you have the attack detector. So I'd like to talk about these two different kinds of, of things. And of course, the attack detectors have to be statistically based. They have to be based on what is normal and what is abnormal. So in this first part, uh, the kind of original idea that we've come up with is that you can create this um, quasi-deterministic uh, scheduling uh, for the nodes, for all of them. And as a result, you will have quasi no queues at the gateway. So you don't have congestion at the gateway. That's a trick, okay? It's like, you know, the story, um, uh, should you wait um, at home or at the bus stop? So the thing is, you know, uh, wait at home, don't go to the bus stop because you'll be cold or get rain and have a big queue at the bus stop doesn't help. If you right, arrive there at the right time, it's better and that there's no queue at the bus stop. So this is more or less the idea here. Um, it's very simple as you will see and it works. And uh, the uh, original idea here, the original idea there is basically what I've just said. And the original idea here is to say, 
Uh, look, there are so many different kinds of attacks, right? Uh, you can't design an attack detector for everything. Uh, perhaps what you can do is design an attack detector that learns what is normal. So you train on the normal, and then you get upset if anything looks different from what you expect. Okay? So the training with, with uh, normal is something uh, one calls auto-associative. Uh, that is, you, um, you associate yourself with a certain trend, and you learn that, and then you use kind of a metric to tell yourself whether uh, things are abnormal or not. And we've done this with, with several uh, uh, several techniques, several kind of vari variants on similar techniques, and their machine learning algorithms. Okay. Uh, now, if with machine learning, you have a question, oh, my God, isn't go it going to be computationally very expensive? And the answer is, what is computationally expensive is learning. It's not executing. So detection is just a pass-through. You're just letting the data through, doing some transformations, and then you can hardwareize that. And then you just have a metric that says, this is good, this is bad. So uh, detection is fast, learning is long. So learning can be done offline, or it can be, be also be done online. Uh, you can retrain yourself online. But the main thing is that uh, the learning part is the quote unquote expensive part. The detection part is the fast part. And our kind of original idea is to, uh, it's actually twofold. One is to say, well, um, we will learn from normality. We won't try to learn every possible kind of attack because you know, you have data sets. There's A attack, B attack, C attack, D attack, et cetera. If you spend your time training yourself on all possibilities, you'll do a mishmash. And in fact, you'll be, have a hard time, in fact, doing detection because you'll one type of attack will be noise on the other ones that you're learning. So that's not necessarily the best thing to do. But then the other way would be to say, I'm going to have an attack for this, a detector for this, a detector for that, a detector for another thing. Yes. Just a, qu a, qu a question and a comment. I think this is related to what we call anomaly detection. Uh, the, the, what you are talking, you are, you are considering normal behavior, and then what is outside is anomaly detection. Right. And uh, then I have a question, if there is a new device that is, that is, a, no, that is a, who should be able to connect to the network, but is, uh, it is a new device with a new behavior, then you will maybe de uh, uh, declare it as, uh, as an attack. Uh, that's possible, but you, you don't look at the, uh, that's true. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a network of this kind, if your detectors are the gateways, I don't think one will make a difference because you have such a collection of things. Uh, and certainly if it's one of, a number of things that you have already seen it won't, but if you have a new one, as you were saying, completely new, you'd have to relearn. So you would, you would, you would relearn, uh, relearn, you know, have it generate normal traffic with the others in the presence of others, and you'd learn all of that traffic. So uh, it means that, yes, you have to relearn and, and do that, yeah. So, but the other interesting thing is that, in fact, uh, our neural networks are actually queuing networks. Uh, so they're G networks. Um, uh, think of a Jackson network. Okay, uh, what is particularity? If you in increase the traffic rates in a Jackson network, all the metrics grow. Uh, okay, so uh, so everything grows. But in G networks, as your inputs grow, it may grow and decrease. Why? Because there are so-called negative customers. So you, you increase even the positive ones, but they switch to being negatives and they will reduce Q lengths. So in fact, uh, these G networks, not just because of that, but because of their more detailed mathematics are universal function approximators. So they're uh, for continuous and bounded functions. So you can take any, if you wish, data set, which remains bounded in its values, and you can build a G network that will approximate it arbitrarily finding Okay, arbitrarily, arbitrarily accurately. And how do you increase the accuracy? By increasing the number of so-called neurons. Okay. So in this work, we've used that idea to build detectors based on G networks. It turns out they're more accurate than using uh, these you know, standard machine learning techniques, uh, support vector machines, 
long-term, short-term memories, et cetera, multi-level perceptron, multi-layer multi perceptrons, and so on. So they're more accurate. I mean, through all our tests show that they're, they're more accurate. That's why we managed to publish this stuff. But there is one more interesting idea here. And that is <clears throat> the G networks have an analytical structure. Okay, so we write the G network equations analytically, we express them analytically. I said that accuracy increases the number of neurons increases. Well, use the following trick. Rather than have a network with say a thousand neurons, which we do sometimes have a thousand neurons, we actually have a network with an infinite number of neurons and take the limit. So we get transfer functions taken in the limit for these networks. And this gives us the potential for more accurate learning. So there are a number of interesting ideas in this, in this part of the, of the story. Uh, I don't know whether you, you, you get the idea. So uh, suppose you have like a, a thousand neurons. I mean, a thousand neurons is a lot of computation. Why? Because it's ON3. Learning is going to be ON3. Uh, if you have a recurrent network, you know, a network of feedback, and we do, uh, then we're going to have like a lot of computation. So we get rid of that. And we say, I'm not going to have a thousand neurons, I'm going to have an infinite number of them. In that case, I just take the transfer function, the corresponding transfer function, and I'll show you what the equations look like. And I'll use that jig inside, and then it's just one more computation. So uh, a number of ideas like that. Okay. So, sorry, wrong computer. Uh, let's start with uh, the first question, the performance issue. And the performance issue is uh, the massive access problem, uh, IoT massive access problem. And what's happening? Well, uh, this is, uh, as I said, you know, we have a lot of availability of a lot of traces of data and so on. So we can use that for our experiments and for testing. So this is one set of uh, IoT data. Uh, this is the um, uh, packet rate coming in. Okay, this is the time. Uh, so um, you have time dependent arrivals, and you're having these repetitions. And this is not surprising because some will have a certain periodicity, others will have different periodicity, and so on. So you'll end up having various patterns, traffic patterns. And then you will also have uh, the uh, size of packets. Okay, so you have sizes like that. So this gives you. No, this is number of occurrences among uh, 12 million packets that we looked at in this data set. And we see that, you know, so many of them have this length, others have that length, have others have that length, and so on. Okay? So you, you get your statistics, packet statistics that we, that we, that we use as, you know, as traces. And um, if you have an IoT gateway, uh, and you look at what this traffic does to the gateway, and what you see is this is what it does. What is the topology in terms of the gateway? So start, you have start, all of these nodes. Start, start topology. You have all of these nodes. Yeah. Absolutely, you have right. all of these nodes. You can't coordinate them and from the, single, the gateway. Single gateway. Okay. Right. The only way you could possibly coordinate them is let them have a local coordination, which is what QDTP does. But you, you can't coordinate them. So they, they're, they're sending their stuff when they want. And when they want this, this is real traffic. So, I mean, we've just taken an example. Uh, so they, they send it when they want and, and they do. So there is no multi hop? No, between it's a the, single uh, hop okay. over a wireless channel. And uh, this is what the gateway gets. Okay? Now, of course, if you have enough, if you can handle this, that's fine. And this is assuming that you're handling this. But chances are you can't. And in fact, you will be losing a lot of traffic. Okay. Now, um, uh, M is actually the number of, uh, M here represents the number of IoT devices that we're handling. And so we have a, a large number of IoT devices. And uh, so if you do the QDTP algorithm, then you're going to have this. Okay. So basically, you're going to bring down massively uh, the Q rank at the gateway. And for the uh, individuals, it doesn't make any difference. They're going to have the issue. Great. So um, 
and this is without losing any packet in which case in, so with QDP, uh, yeah. you don't lose packets. You lose packets, so you, you don't just lose uh, packets. organize. Uh, uh, yeah, you don't lose packets. You just change the way they are allowed to transmit. Okay. And uh, so uh, if you may forward packets, for, that is, you always guarantee that at the gateway, your output rate, uh, your maximum output rate is less than the maximum input rate at, at, the, at the individual nodes, IoT nodes. And you don't have, and in fact, you can also calculate exactly what happens. So this uh, is the way you you uh, uh, might uh, do things if you were, you, you know, if you take a, a simple approach to handling this, is you um, have some kind of of uh, scheduling algorithms. Uh, you can you can use different kinds of scheduling algorithms with. Uh, uh, with uh, based on on deadline driven scheduling, uh, what is deadline driven scheduling? It's an old idea, uh, which is kind of the optimum, where you try to uh, always send forward at the gateway the packet whose deadline is uh, the closest to you in time. Okay, this is the earliest deadline first algorithm. So why would you do that? All of IoT packets have their own deadline. They need to get the information through to you by a given time. So you might want to, at the gateway, as a first solution to this problem, you might say, well, uh, I'm going to do scheduling. And then I'm going to look at uh, the probability of missing deadlines. Uh, as a function of load. Now here, load is expressed on the uh, x-axis as number of IoT devices. So it's a uh, number of IoT devices and this kind of maps into an arrival rate, this maps into a, a, a higher, higher moment of the arrival process. But so you're going to have, you know, you're going to do a slotted thing with deadlines, okay? So you're looking for solutions. But the, the story is that you're still getting, you know, on the order of 10%, uh, loss rates. Okay, so these are going to be uh, perhaps unacceptable. Uh, so this is not, you know, just deadline-driven scheduling. It's not uh, the solution. So the idea here about QDTP is uh, that uh, you decide on the instance uh, T at which you release the n plus first packet at a given IoT device. Okay. So uh, if uh, the arrival instance is uh, identical, to, is, is, if the arrival instance is larger than the last time you sent it through, plus a fixed time, uh, then you just let it through. Okay. If on the other hand, uh, if uh, the arrival time is earlier than the time that you have said, it, you're just timing it. You're saying, look, you're not allowed to let your stuff through unless the time units have come, through, have, have come by. So that's what you do. It's very simple. And then you say, well, uh, in that case, my good friend, you wait till you have that time coming up. Okay? So you don't do any deadline scheduling. You don't do anything like that. You just deal with when people are, are allowed to come out. And based on this, uh, you can uh, write uh, Lindley's equation, obviously, right? a form of Lindley's equation. You write your uh, form of Lindley's equation. And uh, what you can show, uh, this is in the case where you do FIFO. And uh, uh, this is down there. <laughs> Sorry about this. I've tried to put everything on one slide. This is in the case where you do QDPP. Okay? And what you can show is that you are creating a new local queue. But this local queue is not, is housed where? It's housed at the individual IoT devices. So the total amount, okay, the, the local queue and the queue in the buffer is the same because you have not changed things with respect to your, your output flow. You're getting exactly the same, you know, sample wise, you're getting the same time spent waiting at your home 
was time spent waiting at the gate. This is the same. But this is where they wait. Okay, all of them wait. So actually, this queue becomes very small. That's just a simple idea. Yeah. And you can show this. I mean, it's a pure sample, a sample path result. Uh, you, you have a kind of a very neat way of uh, taking care of this. Now, of course, if S sub n is the service time of the gateway, that hasn't changed. Okay, you have your service time at the gateway. And um, uh, if the time delay at the IoT device, this D amount that you delay at the IoT device is less than or equal to the service time at the gateway, then the time that you spend at the IoT device plus the time that you spend at the gateway is less than or equal to FIFO. Okay, so you're, you're preserving the total amount of time spent is the same for everyone, okay? But the concentration is happening here. Okay, this is taking up uh, the time and therefore the queue here is obviously much, much shorter. Think of little swarm that. Yeah. Just a, a question to see if I understood well. Uh, this suppose that the, uh, all the devices are aware of uh, QDTP protocol. Yeah, you, you have so given you are, that's you need, all they need to do. So it's to very computationally, it's very simple. Yeah, but you, you, you need to, you have, you have so many devices from different vendors. So you need all the devices to talk this, uh, this protocol. Uh, maybe it is a problem. <laughs> it might be impossible to impose as a norm or something like that. Now, it may be possible to impose, just a sec, just to respond to that, it may be possible to impose if you have a, a, a channel, um, a two-way channel. That is, the permission is given by the gateway. So yeah. the, if you yes, have a two-way channel it, it and the permission... A, it is another uh, thing that we need to be implemented uh, on the device side also. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Very good point, yeah. However, if only half of your devices actually use that protocol and the others want to just send, you're still getting good results where you're decreasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, for some of them, it's gotten much better and for others, unfortunately not. But so. at the gateway, the gateway, the load will still be small. That's right. The gateway already has gotten rid of, you know, has so offloaded some of its so problems. Half of them are so you problems. could focus, for instance, on the worst cases. You know, you could focus on the guys who have the most traffic or whatever. Uh, and this is the condition. Obviously, this is a condition for several reasons. One of them is that if you didn't have this condition, you would have congestion. Uh, you would have an unstable system. So you, you must be letting people through at the rate which corresponds to something which is less than or equal to that. Okay. Uh, so um, some results. Uh, I had shown you this before. Uh, this uh, corresponds to total time, uh, while this corresponds to uh, delay uh, or yeah, um, queue length rather at the devices. So tiny, okay, a fraction of one service time or one, what you might call an equivalent service time. So you have a very short. Uh, delays. Uh, don't forget that the, the, the gateway uh, is where the service actually happens, while the devices are where just the value D is imposed to delay the transmission. So what you're seeing here is that you know overall you have improved, but also at the devices there isn't a problem. You're not having a problem. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure to get one point. So the D. I mean, you you impose that. Any two packets from the whole collection are separated by D, or do you impose that everybody sends at at most? No, you impose that any successive transmission does not happen before D. A successive by the same device, or successive for the whole collection? For the whole collection. For the, that's why you need the scheduling. Uh, D, you need the information to guarantee this D. From the central, from the uh, center of the star, right? Okay, and you do Absolutely. you do a scheduling with Absolutely. separate things, and queuing Absolutely. takes place in a remote. Uh, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. You're just pushing back the queuing, but then all the queues are small. Okay, so that's the uh, so you see this on uh, 
uh, results. Um, okay, now you look at you know uh, what happens if you don't do any scheduling uh, in sort of you know earlier deadline first, and you're just looking at the um, at the probability of missing deadlines. And this is the kind of thing that you, you see. So with here, you're seeing what's happening if you don't do this. And here you're seeing 10 to the minus seven deadlines, a probability of missing deadlines. If only, so, if we need two packets, uh, the delta is the number of uh, the length of the buffer in the gateway. Uh, what, what is delta? Delta equal to, yeah. I do not remember. Uh, delta is uh, basically uh, what the the uh, deadline is. Okay. It's deadline in some time units. Okay. So uh, this is a short deadline. Delta, yeah, yeah, delta yeah. equals ten is a large deadline. Uh, you know, a good one. But my deadline is, is, is very late. And delta equals one is my deadline is tiny. So uh, that's what it uh, what it is, and what you're seeing here is that you know with short deadlines, basically you don't miss them, miss them. I mean you do, but it's ten to minus seven, and this is trace driven. So it's so you're gaining. The moral of the story is you're gaining not just in QN, but you're also gaining in, miss, in avoiding missed deadlines, and this shows you you know. Uh, the way the queue lengths are going, uh, they of course oscillate. Okay, uh, this is a fairly large number of, uh, of, of uh, instead of an extreme case, a very large number of devices. And uh, again, you see, you know, average uh, over time, uh, uh, queue length per device averaged over all of the devices. And here you see. Um, the human itself know how it how it oscillates. Can I ask one more question? Sure. <laughs> so uh, you have published that this is uh, time has elapsed now since the last packet, and uh, if there is a candidate, but assume there are many candidates to transmit the next packet. How do you arrange the? How do you how do you, how do you elect? Do, how do you elect the next one? And according to it may have impact on so the. That would be a fixed rule. A uh, fixed rule, but fixed you need rule. fairness. You need fairness. You can't. Don't you want do you fairness? Want fairness between all these. No, uh, I mean, the way you would do it in practice is you'd have a fixed rule. Uh, you'd say this one number so and so has higher priority than number so and so. That's the, the way you do it in practice, and you use that to establish something that corresponds to what you what you'd like to see happen. Uh, okay, so this kind of concludes the first part of my uh, presentation. And the second part is about attack detection, okay, or uh, anomaly detection. Depending, I mean, some people write papers called anomaly detection, others called attack detection. We actually um, do uh, simulations or when we do uh, like uh, learning and we do testing, we actually use attack traffic and not anomaly traffic. So, you know, there are, uh, DARPA has developed some databases, others have developed some data databases. So we use existing databases of attacks. Uh, how are they collected? How are the attack databases collected? Simple enough. What they do is they put out a network and they don't say what it is, uh, but they put like an IP address that looks like it's in Washington or in some military base. Okay, and all the attacks come. <laughs> so a lot of, you know, in fact, let me tell you a true joke. Uh, we were um, not about the attack detection itself, but we uh, also did some work on so-called honeypots. Uh, honeypots are software designed to attract attacks so that you can study them and see whether your system works or not. So we were very proud in the CER IoT project, we were very proud of our honeypot. And um, we also wanted to do uh, video demos. So we set up a video demo on a website where people could see what was happening in, uh, with um, robots doing some manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, and talking to each other through the network. And we put a honeypot. We wanted to demonstrate the honeypot too. Very soon, the website wasn't working anymore <laughs> because the attacks had become very effective. 
<laughs> so what we, the demonstration was our honeypot works and attracts attacks. <laughs> Uh, funny things. Okay, so uh, uh, using G networks as attack vectors. Okay, what are G networks? Well, you everyone knows what a Jackson network is, and uh, a G network is, in some sense, a strong generalization. Okay. Uh, you still have exponential service times uh, at the service stations. You still have Poisson arrivals of customers. But the customers are not what they were before. Okay? The only ones that are like the previous ones are the so-called positive customers. The positive customers are your old, good old time customers. Uh, what do the positive customers do? As long as they remain positive, they go around the network and at some point they leave. Okay? Then you have the negative customers. The negative customers are the ones who arrive at the station and destroy one or a batch of jobs. Not necessarily just one, they can destroy a batch with an arbitrary probability distribution, okay? These are the negative ones, but the positive ones can become negative as they move around, okay? So they go around and all of a sudden they become bad guys and they become okay, fine. But then there are also triggers. And what do triggers do? Triggers do load balancing. What they do is they get somewhere and they say, you customer sitting here, please move over there. So they kind of probabilistically send customers around the network. Okay? Uh, and then there are other things. Uh, there are um, um, sequences of triggers. That is, you have a rep repetitions of triggers, uh, which means that you uh, move, 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 but, but in a kind of, you might have a cluster of, of cells and you're moving an arbitrary, probabilistic arbitrary number of times among them before you actually go away, okay? And as you move, of course, as, as these customers are moved, uh, they move others and so on. And what happens every time they move, of course, they're going to reduce the queue length somewhere and they're going to increase the queue length somewhere else. Okay. So they have a, the effects of, of uh, the, the triggers have the effect of negative customers for the receivers and of, if you wish, positive customer for the, uh, sorry, negative customers for the receivers of the trigger and positive customers for the receivers of the, of the customer that has moved. So the kind of interesting things. So these, then there are, yeah, so there are a number of, of variants and I haven't gone through all of them. Uh, the, these things are represented as usual by Chapman Kolmogorov equations, you know, just like with the uh, Jackson networks. And they have, lo and behold, big surprise, they have product form solution with all of these different things. They have product form solution, but the big difference is that the traffic equations are not here. So that your, your traffic equations are not the good old linear equations anymore, they're nonlinear. So what does that mean when they're nonlinear? The first thing that you they mean that the, the first thing that comes up is can you prove that the, the solution to these traffic equations exists? Because they're nonlinear. And the answer is yes. So it's the, it was the initial work essentially, which was done by myself, where we proved, where I proved that the, the traffic equations have a unique solution. Uh, and then can you solve it practically? And the, the answer is yes, you solve it through fixed point iterations. So you have a nonlinear equation, which you uh, like Q equals F of Q vector, Q equals F of vector Q, and the fixed point iteration gets pro, uh, converges and produces a solution. So they, they, that's what they give you. And uh, they are universal approximators. What does that mean? That means we proved uh, with a colleague that in fact, uh, for any, in fact, with two colleagues, uh, we prove that uh, for any continuous and bounded function, okay, and variables, uh, you, uh, you can find a uh, G network that approximates it within epsilon. You fix your epsilon, and you know, if you're not, you reduce the epsilon, you have to increase the size of that. So we did that. And then <coughs> another thing that I had done early on is that I had shown that you can actually fit cost functions. So if you say, for instance, I have a queuing network and I'd like the utilization here to be close to this value and there to be close to that value and so on. So you have some kind of norm between the values of the utilization, say, at the different queues and some fixed numerical values that you want to match. Okay. And, uh, or, or some perhaps more complicated cost function. In any case, 
you're going to have a, a gradient algorithm, which is uh, of complexity entry for a network with feedback. Yeah. So could you uh, comment on this universal approximation uh, result? So this is the uh, steady state of the queuing network, which the, net the queuing network is always analyzing a steady state because that's the only place where we have analytical results. Yes. And at the steady state, the state, uh, the distribution, uh, or whatever, I mean, I can approximate any function. Yes. Uh, and uh, okay. So, but it's a random variable. So uh, no, it's not, because uh, because uh, the probability you're dealing with probabilities. The probabilities are not random variables. The probabilities are real numbers. Ah, the, <laughs> the okay. So you're not saying that ah. the random process approximates. Okay. You're saying that the for instance, the stationary probability of queue length or the probability that the queue is busy, that those things approximate continuous and bounded functions. So, but there is one variable per queue, right? Uh, and so it's the integers times the power well, of you, the number. You have, you, you, uh, yeah, if you, when you have a queuing network, that right. becomes a, a vector. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're dealing with, uh, with n, n valued and n, n variable functions. Functions with n variables, but each variable is an integer value, which is the distribution of. No, the... it's not an integer value; it's a real value. Suppose you take Q the utilization as your output variable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you're dealing with real numbers. Okay, I see. Right. So there are basically there are no integers. If you're looking, if you're using the averages uh, as approximators, you're still dealing with real numbers and so on. So you're never dealing with actual Q lengths. You're dealing with expectations of Q lengths, or you're dealing with probabilities that the Q lengths are positive. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. And in that sense, in, in, in that context, it's actually you know kind of identical to the way people do neural networks, because then a Q is a neuron. Uh, basically, the Q and the neuron is the same thing, and the neuron is activated between zero and one. And the probability that the uh, Q length is uh, positive is also between zero and one. Okay, so you have kind of a very similar, uh, very similar way of looking at this. Okay. Uh, yeah, that that result. If you want to have a look at it, uh, yeah, the universal approximation it was published in the Transactions on Neural Networks a long time ago, around two thousand. Um, uh, now. Um, Okay, uh, the simplest case, positive and negative customers, is in itself equivalent to a spiking neural network. Uh, why? Uh, because you can think of the uh, Q length as the voltage at the neuron. And you can think of the utilization, just mentioned that, the probability that the Q length is positive, you can think of that as the activation function of the neuron. So the case with positive and negative customers already has all the nonlinearities. In fact, it is, it is already a universal approximator for continuous and bounded functions. And uh, so the whole structure carries over very nicely. Um, let me just skip all that. Um, just repeating myself. Um, okay, extensions, multiple classes. For instance, if you think about again this uh, relationship with uh, uh, with neurons, uh, you'd say, well, why? What kind of application would I use multiple classes for? So we have, you know, product form. The the the, the G networks can have multiple classes. So, for instance, certain classes of positive uh, are affected by certain other classes of negative, and not by all. You can have those kinds of relations. So, uh, how would you set up a relationship with, say, something which one usually does with neurons? And what we did, we used multiple classes to represent color. So each class is the RGB. So you need, you know, if you're dealing with, if you're trying to learn properties of color images, uh, then you have, need three classes, basically the RGB, right? Because your pictures are going to be that way. So we did exactly that. We used a multiple class neural network to deal with color images. Well, all, a lot of these things are kind of nice. Now, you know, the batch removal, <clears throat> it is in real neurons, batch removal means that a negative customer arrives and removes a whole bunch of, uh, I mean, set, basically can set 
the neuron to zero, the, the arriving Q to, to zero Q length. Uh, that corresponds, in fact, to some neurons, and they exist in our kind of system, in our brains, that are able with one spike to set the other, uh, turn off other neurons. They're strongly inhibitory. So the, all of these things are kind of correspond quite well to the um, to, uh, <clears throat> things that we, we know about. Okay. Um, uh, skip all that. No, okay. Now, attack detection. Uh, the, um, I'm just indicating a number of, of papers there. And the um, uh, traffic is coming in, right? We're examining traffic to decide whether the traffic contains attacks or not. So you extract, first of all, certain characteristics of the traffic. For instance, packet size. For instance, time between packets. Uh, higher moments. So you're extracting characteristics of the traffic. And you're going to, since you're basically, you're not allowed to read the packets themselves, you have to look at what they look like outside to determine whether they're uh, going to be uh, attackers or not. Okay? So you, you do extraction of certain parameters. And then you have a G network in the middle. And you see that you have clusters here. Okay? Uh, each of these clusters actually count, uh, often that has a, an infinite number of uh, cubes, if you wish, or an infinite number of neurons. Uh, why? Because we've just uh, written the equations and taken the limit, essentially. So we have a lot of neurons, but the computation is just as many as the number of clusters. The complexity of the computation is proportional to the number of clusters. It's a feed-forward network. Therefore, learning is going to be ON2 in number of clusters and not ON3 anymore. Okay. And uh, what does um, auto-associative learning mean? It means that I look at the input okay, in my learning phase. In my learning phase, I feed it only normal traffic. What I consider normal traffic is fed into the network uh, at the learning phase. And for each input, I match with the output. Okay? And I reinforce the weights. I increase uh, the uh, weights, which give me this result. So I'm using the gradient descent learning technique to reinforce the weights so that I learn the normal. So every time it's normal, I increase the weights accordingly. And this is all that happens at the learning phase. At the detection phase, what I do is I just let in any traffic. And as long as my error function is small, I conclude that it's normal. When the error function goes above a certain thre threshold, I consider that it's an attack, that I'm in, in presence of an attack. Okay, so a very simple idea. And these are the kinds of results uh, you're getting. And when you look at this, you're interested in uh, true positives and true negatives. Okay. Uh, false positives. Uh, you're going to say something. I was wondering. So, uh, what are the weights exactly in the in the net, in the product form network? You will you will see it in a minute. Ah, okay. Uh, okay right. You will it's see right. an equation. I didn't put any equations okay. down. Okay. Uh, one of them, uh, the weights are uh, what is coming from the previous level mm -hmm. okay. and the parameter inside. Okay, thank you. So you're, uh, you're updating these so that you uh, minimize the difference between uh, real and uh, true and true. I mean, uh, 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 in fact, it's not a fact. So then you evaluate this. The way you evaluate this is in the following manner. Uh, you evaluate it in, on the one hand through uh, looking at how well you do with uh, two negatives. Two negatives is I have detected an attack. Sorry, I have not detected an attack. True positive is I have detected an attack. So you, you look at this and you look at this. These are the things that are interesting. True negative means I decide there is no attack. And true positive means I decide it's an attack. And whether it's true or not is you know, how accurate you're doing, how accurate you're doing. So we're getting the moral of the story here. Uh, this is a decision threshold. 
So if your error here goes above uh, 0 0.2, it's supposed to be an attack. Uh, if it's under 0 0.2, it's, it's supposed to be a non attack. And here, if you do it, this is the case of 0 0.4, 0 0.4 is obviously too large. Okay, you're being too tolerant. Uh, as you as your uh, threshold increases, you're being less uh, discriminating. Uh, as your threshold is low, it means you kind of get upset quickly. You react quickly. You, you tend to react more sensitive. So the first thing that you look at is the uh, this, these these two curves. The kind of aspects that are interesting, and um, uh, the other thing that's interesting is, is the training time how much compute time. Now, you can uh, evaluate training times in an abstract way uh, through uh, you know, complexity functions and so on. But usually, it's not very representative because a lot of the computation is in the details of the way these algorithms are implemented. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the KNN and Lasso, for instance, these are represented. Uh, what we're doing here is um, <clears throat> just taking existing state-of-the-art software while this is our own so this is state-of-the-art software and what we're getting here is that our training time is uh, substantially higher okay but still the same order of magnitude uh, while uh, with k and k nearest neighbors uh, it's a very well-known classification technique uh, there we're getting slightly better training time, but you know, same order of like the, the moral of the story is it's kind of the same order of like the training times. Um, okay, I, I need to say a little bit more before I go into the details of the picture. Let me see, where is my, uh, yeah, all the details of the equations, okay. Now, the thing is that um, uh, the, if you wish, the, 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 uh, the, the challenge, uh, the interesting thing is to, uh, I mean, if you look at the literature, the literature has literally thousands of papers where people say, here is this attack type. type. I have trained it to attack, to detect this attack type. Basically, they don't have auto associative learning. What they learn is the characteristics of the attack and then use that in a neural network to detect whether the attack is happening or not. Uh, and then you have also other papers that say, well, I'm going to train it to detect this, that, and the other. So, of course, if you, if you kind of vary the attacks too much, you won't really, I mean, it all, all gets very muddled. And so the novelty here, as I said before, is to learn from normal traffic, not from attacks. And the method is what we call, because you know, when you publish the neural network literature, you have to use some kind of neural network terminology. We call this the dense random neural network. And this was done uh, by one of my students uh, some years ago, Yong Hua Yin uh, at, at Imperial. So the, the technique was developed uh, by the technique, not necessarily because of for uh, attack detection in particular, because he started off with, uh, with uh, recognizing, for instance, written characters and things like that, in his thesis. So, this random neural network. And what is it? It's a G network with triggered custom movements, but with repetitive triggering. It is, uh, you have instantaneous triggering in a subset of nodes. So I fire, I send something to the other guy, I push his uh, customer off to the next one, and this is going on a certain number of times with probability P. So there's a tuning parameter P that, that is what you need to learn. Okay? And then, of course, when you do this, you can write what the network as a whole is doing, and you can take n tends to infinity and I think this is what's in, the, in this equation. Okay, this is what the equations look like. And they kind of then simplify because you have the n's here, n minus one cancels with the n, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the equations become simple because your n is big. 
the number of cells is big in the cluster. And you say, well, to hell with it, it's going to be infinite. And then you uh, have a strongly simplified expression. Uh, uh, so this expression simplifies with a minus one. And you see the parameter p is, you know, this triggering, uh, repeated triggering of, uh, of, uh, uh, of nodes of each other. So this is what it looks like at, in one, one of the clusters. And you, you look at this is a term that says uh, how uh, the previous layer acts upon the successive layer. So each of these clusters influences the next cluster, uh, but differently. So I'm in this position and all the guys that are following me, this guy is going to be influenced by a value, another one by another value. Another. So you have inhibitory influences uh, to the next level. So these are the parameters that you adjust. And so, and the, the if you come back to the just slide before, uh, you the, the 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 output are point processes, right? Uh, is, is the, our, no, 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 no. They're they're what they, they're, they're uh, probability that the Q is busy. Ah, okay. So it is you end up having a macroscopic view of the probability that the Q is busy with okay. a thousand of them. So the input are point processes because these are packet uh, times and things no, like the, that. The, or? the inputs uh, are real numbers. Real numbers. Well, they're real numbers, but you know, uh, in terms of statistics, they are point processes. Okay. Uh, but they are real numbers. I mean, they're just uh, sometime you have nothing happening. Okay. Sometime you have something happening. So it is a, in fact a point process. Okay. But uh, the, you're you're dealing with the real numbers, which are, for instance, the the, the packet length. Which is a point process uh, with okay. the mm -hmm. uh, uh, the time between packets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you're mm -hmm. dealing with metrics that you've chosen, which are indicative of traffic characteristics. The, the thing is, you know, when you start, you don't know what traffic characteristics you choose. So you try to be exhaustive. This one has 40 inputs. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you don't know what's going to be important when you have what is what is normal traffic. I have no idea. So this is in fact a 40. Uh, the input and output layers are in order of 40, and the intermediate la layers can be smaller or bigger. Uh, just why 40? Because you know, why 40 parameters of the input? Just because I don't know what I should take. I try to take everything. Okay. And the, uh, the output is this uh, one feature of the steady state probability, and you said it was linked to the chance it is a that uh, something prob probability of, of, this, uh, of this cluster. Of this cluster to be empty or something like that. Okay, I see. Part two. Okay. And okay, and here you okay, I, I get it. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. So the computational unit is, uh, and, and the fact that I mean, the trick of taking us an infinite number has turned out to be a good one, <laughs> uh, which is fine. Fun. Anyway, so you get that, and then you know, you get a lot of uh, uh, statistical results that you can look at. What, what is this? Mm, well, there's lots of stuff here. Yeah, um, these are the kinds of results that you um, you're getting. So this is the case where in the input data you have a lot of kind of results. There are the, the, this is the KDD data set. It's it's, a, it's an old data set from DARPA taken on a real network, and uh, they have all kinds of attacks. So what does this say? This is saying, uh, I have this RNN, multi-layer RNN with these uh, input parameters, and I run all my traffic. Now the uh, KDD data has the ground truth. That is for any packet, it can tell you what kind of attack it is or if it's a normal packet. Okay. Everything is kind of ground truth, they mark it all. And so here, this is saying, oh, the Apache two type of attack I can detect at 99.7% accuracy. Uh, the accuracy is true positive and uh, true positives and true negatives. So uh, here, I'm, I, this is that one I'm very good at, at detecting. This one I'm pretty bad at detecting. This one I'm oh, okay. Uh, that one again, I'm really good, etc. 
So you have all these different kinds of attacks and you have an evaluation of how well you're doing on different kinds of attacks. These are the types of results that you're supposed to present in papers in this area. Uh, now, this is a comparison. I told you that we have about 40 inputs. We try to kind of collect every kind of sensible statistic about the input, uh, about the input traffic. And we have two architectures, one with 20, 41, 20, 41. So you have 41 clusters at the input, 20 in the middle, and 41 again at the output. Okay, why the same at the output? Because you have to compare, it's auto-associative, so you have to compare input and output. Uh, and here what you're saying is that, you know, uh, um, the uh, doesn't seem to make, be making a huge amount of difference. I guess uh, the, this one is slightly better. Uh, why is that? Because there's probably more mixing uh, in the middle layer. So the, the data is being mixed in the middle layer. And perhaps that's why we're getting slightly better results, but it's not really true because here you have 92.3, here you have 91.9, with well, differences in significant perhaps. Uh, here you have slightly less, uh, here slightly higher and so on. So you're getting some idea of the overall performance. So these are the usual statistics that you use accuracy, true negative, true positive, uh, precision at once or etc. These are kind of standard statistical terms uh, that one uses. Uh, compare comparison with support vector machines. Now SVMs are kind of a massive, very uh, uh, heavyweight uh, type of, of approach, uh, which should normally get you a lot of accuracy. And you see the computation times, the SVM, and you see the computation times with uh, our, our methods. So we're much faster, much, much faster. Uh, but lo and behold, we're more accurate. Okay, we're getting bit better accuracy. Uh, perhaps because we have a much bigger network uh, in the sense that we have, you know, infinite number of nodes in the clusters. So that, that's kind of interesting. Um, so these are the conclusions, uh, generally, uh, as compared to uh, SVM, which is kind of known to be a uh, massif. It's a huge kind of tool. Uh, we do better with much less computation, which is useful, of course, because it means that your learning time is shorter and your amount of energy consumed is shorter and so on and so forth. And you can put it on simpler machines, less powerful machines. Okay.